Let's meet Bo of the fifth column, and it seems that he doesn't know much about nuclear energy, or energy for that matter. The troublesome thing here is that this guy has over 860,000 subscribers, and this video that I'm now going to pick apart for you has been seen 62,000 times. Now I can only beg to the gods to get a thousand views on this video that I'm going to make, but you know, that's just the way it is. I'm not as popular as this guy, though he has a, a, a formidable beard, I have to say. I mean, my beard is just a little little beard now let's see what he has to say now do keep in mind that i have cut into these things not i have not rearranged anything the only thing that i've done is i've cut out silences that's all a whole bunch of countries um around 30 met and they have signed a pledge and the pledge is to increase the use of nuclear energy to create electricity to combat climate change that's that's part of the reason there and that's the main reason for it oh that's pretty self-explanatory the way he begins i mean he, he basically outlines that you know signing a pledge to triple nuclear capacity by 2050 is somehow a problem it's it's just there in the tone of his voice so we're off to a bad start here and and i really don't get what he's getting at because he's saying that you know these countries are pledging this to combat climate change so this is somehow a problem but it gets more confounding down the road the countries that signed on to this the us brazil china saudi arabia france uh, france being a country that actually exports electricity the thing that he misses right here is because there's there's two pledges that happen simultaneously basically or or at the same event, at the COP28 event in the United Arab Emirates. The first thing is that Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and China did not sign uh, this tripling pledge. And for China, this is not really that important because China is already tripling their own nuclear capacity regardless of what all the other countries are doing. And and for India, uh, counts the same, and they, they also did not sign the pledge. Now, he, he also says something about exporting electricity, as France is uh, want to do, uh, as they can do, because they have sufficient nuclear capacity to make sure that they always have sufficient supply. He makes it out as if it's something bad, as if it's not good. But the trouble is that with these 110 countries pledging to triple their renewable capacity, what we're going to see is that there's 110 countries that probably have large moments in time when they simply don't have enough energy for the dumb reason that either the sun isn't available at night, for instance, or that the wind isn't blowing, which happens occasionally. So somebody needs to bail them out. And the countries that the neighbors, the good neighbors that are next to them that have nuclear capacity at that moment, they are very good neighbors because they can give them the juice that they need at that moment. But at the moments when they have too much wind or too much solar, they're going to flood the market with junk electricity, basically. So being able to export power that is needed whenever it is needed is better than being a neighbor that is just going to flood the system with unwanted electricity and it also says that those countries are going to help other countries develop their own nuclear energy infrastructure so they can provide electricity now this is a good one uh, because because basically what these countries also have pledged is that they are going to help others develop their nuclear capabilities and and, and i mean this this is good but he he makes it out to be something that is bad so this is something that is 
surprising in a lot of ways because because of things like Chernobyl, because of Fukushima, because of things like this, there's still a lot of concerns when it comes to the actual facilities themselves. Now we're venturing into Jane Fonda territory here. I mean, this is this is like this is like an age-old nuclear fear-mongering troll action. You know, whenever something something uh, positive is happening within the nuclear sphere, people are planning to build new nuclear reactors. People are always going to throw up their ar their arms and say, "Oh, but what about Fukushima and what about?" Chernobyl. Now, airplanes and cars have killed millions of times more people than nuclear power plants have ever done, and we still use them today. So the question is, why? And I've already put it on the screen, so let's let's read it together, because we learn, we adapt, and we improve. And whenever something happens with an airplane, for instance, or whenever something happens with a a, a very you know, bad car accident, a bus accident, or whatever accident, or a nuclear accident, what ha what happens is we learn from it. So after we have adapted and improved, or basically what, what is in the process of adapting and improving is that we build safety and oversight frameworks. So we we think about what has happened. Why did it go wrong? How can we avoid this in the future? That Those are the basic questions that we ask. Now, the people who are involved with answering these questions that do this for nuclear are some of the smartest human beings that walk around on this planet. These people really don't mince words. They, they, I mean, these people produce, produce documents that are 10,000 pages and they, they, they know exactly at what moment, what went wrong, etc. So, and when we look at uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima, we have to address these two reactors, and I'm also going to address something else, because uh, uh, Three Mile Island was one of the, the, the boogeymans that, that really did a lot of damage in the United States, but not from radiation. So let's let's look at it from this, this perspective. Chronologically, Three Mile Island happened first. Now, what was good about Three Mile Island is that the design was sound. It had a very solid containment building. They had a loss of cooling accident, which meant that they were unable to cool the reactor core. So what you got was a meltdown. Now the corium didn't exit the, the reactor and none of the radioactivity eventually ended up in the surroundings. But still, People like Jane Fonda and Ralph Nader and this 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 whole contingent of anti-nuclear people, they went out on the streets, organized events that saw two hundred thousand people come and look. And this 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 really is just a form of mass hysteria. And what it did was it basically killed the nuclear industry in the United States. But the irony is that the nuclear industry was already so strong, the technology is so beneficial that it really wasn't killable anymore. But new constructions were halted. People start, stopped planning really a lot of new reactors, far less than could have built, were built afterwards. Now, then we got uh, Chernobyl in 1986. Now, Chernobyl was an illegal reactor. The design is illegal. There, there were about a dozen of these. And, and the point is that this reactor did not have any containment to speak of. Plus, when you wanted to shut it down with shutdown rods, first it became more reactive instead of less reactive. It had a positive void coefficient. So the warmer it got, the more active it got. And, and this basically precipitated a runaway effect with a steam explosion and the steam explosion basically blew the lid through the roof and this meant that loads and loads and loads of radioactive materials got distributed into the air. Now don't mistake me, this is not a nice accident to have. Uh, Chernobyl was an absolute train wreck of a nuclear disaster but Russia did not have the correct protocols in place in order to protect the people, in order to handle the accident or the aftermath of the accident as well as should uh, be handled. So in the end, probably somewhere around 4,000 people contracted thyroid cancer from this accident. Now, if that's the most it can do, 
with this scope, this amount of release, the nuclear really isn't that bad. Now, Fukushima came last, 2011, and the irony there is that radiation did not kill anyone. The Tohoku earthquake and the tsunami killed 18,000 people. But then fear of radiation and the fact that these people still had no idea what to do meant that they were going to evacuate elderly and sick people. And about 2,000 of those people died during those evacuations. Now, afterwards, the United Nations and the International Atomic Energy Agency concluded that the, the evacuations were unnecessary. So these 2,000 deaths could have been avoided. But let's consider this. We had three meltdowns or three nuclear accidents. One reactor that really blew its load straight into the air. And then three reactors at Fukushima that did have a meltdown at which hydrogen explosions did occur, but where most of the radioactive material was contained within the nuclear reactors. But beyond that, beyond the health and, and safety concerns that typically accompany this, there's another one that is being that is being raised by climate change activists. So concerns by activists. This is a thing that really, really rattles my bones because because concerned activists generally are not the most uh, rational people. These are not people that have done the calculations. They have done not done correct risk analysis. Um, they have heard something that concerns them, which concerns, which really uh, spooks them. It makes them afraid of something. And that's why they become active. That's why they become activists. Now, I'm an activist as well for nuclear energy, but I have become an activist because I've done the calculations, because I've looked at all the evidence about climate change. I've looked at all the evidence about, you know, wind and solar built rates. I've looked at all the evidence about how much uh, materials we mine. And I simply came to the conclusion that whatever all these activists want, which is we built enough wind and solar, some geothermal, maybe some hydro in the mix, some batteries, and everything will be all right, like Mark C. Jacobson prescribes to us. That simply is not going to happen. These people are fooling themselves. And the trouble is there's, there's academics out there who get stuff published in papers. And, but the, the, the asterisk that should be placed with each of these publications is never read. Well, actually, you don't even get to see them. There is no asterisk. Now, imagine that if we had twice as many nuclear accidents, or let's say four times as many nuclear accidents as we had today, that would still pale in comparison to all the damage that, that, that coal has done, that gas has done, that the, the, the usage of fossil fuels has done. And, and there's, an, there's, there's also another thing that I want to highlight here, and it is that some of these activists, they want to restructure society. And I find it highly doubtful that their ideal vision of a new society is ever going to be met. We are never going to reach that because most people don't want it. I agree that, you know, people in the West, they can do with less. So suppose that we do with less, we cut 20% of our primary energy use. Those people who are now still not being born in the in the non-OECD countries, so that's like 2 billion people that are still in the pipeline, they have to start somewhere. And the electricity and the energy for, for those 2 billion people still is not being generated today. So we need to add that on top of what we need to decarbonize these days. It's never going to happen because all these people, they need more energy. And this whole utopian, let's do more with nature stuff is simply going to be inefficient. It's not going to be effective enough to feed all these people, give them clothes, give them the means they need to live, you know, good lives. When you're talking about nuclear power plants, they take a really long time to bring online. So construction time concerns, uh, when we look at the medium construction time for a nuclear reactor, that's about eight years. Now, the fastest nuclear reactors were built in four years and the longest, I mean, there's, there's nuclear power constructions that have been halted. So they basically uh, last forever. Uh, this is an unfinished nuclear, there's an unfinished nuclear power plant in the Philippines. 
there's an unfinished nuclear power plant in Poland. Um, you know, uh, I believe it was uh, Watts Bar, one of those reactors, took 25 years to complete. So yes, that takes a long time to build some of these reactors. But nuclear is not inherently slow to build. And if you, if you, for instance, take Vogel as an example, which took like 14 years to do, or 12 years, I, I can't recall at this moment, but it, 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 for all intents and purposes, it was pretty long. Um, but the point is, the United States stopped nu building nuclear reactors, civilian nuclear reactors. They, they still kept building submarines and aircraft carriers, so they know how to build reactors. That's not the problem. The problem is building a, a, a building that has a you know, a nuclear containment building. That's the big problem. Installing the reactor inside, attaching it to a, a power generator building because those are basically two separate buildings. The nuclear building, that's the problem. That's the biggest problem. Um, we have forgotten or we don't, we no longer have the expertise to, to, to plan those and execute the construction of such things. So we need to relearn how to do that. Now, we, we knew how to do that because there have been nuclear reactors in the United States that were built within five years. So it's not something that is unprecedented. We can do that if we put our minds to it. But the planning and the execution are key. And learning how to plan and learning how to execute these, pl these plans quickly enough, efficiently enough, that takes time. You need to learn that stuff. So instead of saying, okay, you know what? Vogel was a bad experience. Let's stop nuclear because it, because it takes too long. The key takeaway should be, okay, now we know how to build Vogel. Uh, we know what went wrong. We know that we can do this differently the next time. So let's plan the next and the next and the next and improve and improve and improve until finally you know how to build these nuclear power plants in four years. And then it won't take that long anymore. And yes, we have ample time to learn that between now and 2050, because anybody who thinks that the, the climate problem will be solved before 2030, I have a bridge to sell them. Never, ever going to happen. On this good earth, no, it doesn't, not on any other planet, it would the thing is, at this point, what the what the activists are saying is that there needs to be a greater focus on renewables that can be brought online quickly. Wind, solar, stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wind and solar, they are fast. You know, from planning till finish, every gigawatt scale power plant, whether that thing is wind, solar, geothermal, nuclear, hydro, it takes years to build, guaranteed. Now, if we look at the time frame that we have right now, we have six years until it's 2030. We're never going to build enough capacity to say, okay, we don't, we, we are at, at zero carbon emissions. It's just not going to happen. The renewal will say look fast because, you know, building a windmill takes like half a year. That's not a problem, but we can't build enough windmills subsequently at the same time in parallel to matter the same thing about these solar panels everybody says oh well just flick the switch turn on the turn on a new factory and they'll roll off and we'll install them forget about it the critical materials needed for these technologies simply aren't produced at the scale that is required today that aren't there we're talking about growth rates of one, two, maybe 3%. While well, what is needed now is a doubling of those critical resources. Simply think about copper, for instance. There's about five tons of copper per megawatt of renewables. It, there's 840 million tons of copper available. If we want to build out, you know, all the renewables that we need, we would need roughly half of all the copper that we can get today. That sounds reasonable. I mean, it's not all the copper that there is. 
So people would say, oh yeah, sure, naturally that is going to work. But what for people forget is that if you want to reach the scale, if you want to reach the, the, the annual additions needed to reach the zero point at 2050, you need, to, you need to produce almost half as much extra copper today as you did the day before. Never ever going to happen with a nominal growth rate of 1, 2, maybe 3%, maybe 4%. Heck, let's make it 10%. It's not going to happen. You cannot sustain a growth rate of 10%, by the way. It's never going to happen. So if we look at just, you know, uh, let, let's 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 do a, 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 a back of the napkin uh, calculation. So suppose that mankind needs somewhere between 200,000 and 300,000 terawatt hours of primary energy by 2100. Or let's say 20, 2050. 2050. Now, now I've said 2100, so this skews the, the calculation a bit. We added... 510 gigawatts of renewable capacity in 2023. If I look at how much we can produce using those renewables, that's roughly 1300 terawatt hours per year. Now, if we would want to get to 300,000 terawatt hours per year, and we would do that at a rate of 1300, of a growth of 1300 terawatt hours per year, it would take us 200 years to get there, 200. That's at the speed at which we are going today. I'm lost for words. These people say, okay, let's let's build wind and solar. We don't even build those things fast enough. And then they say, okay, yeah, well, let's let's forego any benefits that we can have from from nuclear. We don't do it. we don't need nuclear. Wind and solar are fast. This bold the fifth column. The summit occurred the pledge was signed. So the the concerns raised by the activists, they might be taken into consideration, but it's going to be an afterthought because the decision apparently has already been made. So here's here's my key takeaway. Activists don't matter to, to, to a high degree. I think that they shouldn't be listened to. I mean, it, it gives you an idea of how anxious some people are. But that's as far as we should take it. Um, and, and, and besides, I think that they've had enough uh, minutes of fame. Greta Thunberg, you know, shoot, shoot me, shoot the messenger. I think that, it, that they have had enough uh, time in the limelight. Um, also, especially those who say we don't need nuclear. I, 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 I contend that these people don't give a damn about climate change. I do, by the way, uh, I can, I can with, with some idea of what is going on, tell you that if we continue on this path, the tropics and the subtropics are going to become unlivable spaces, you know, two, three, maybe 4 billion people live there by, by, by the time that happens, there's no, water anymore to drink or to wash yourselves with let alone water that is needed to grow f crops and to cultivate farmland what do you think that is going to happen when those places are unlivable you're just playing at being concerned about climate change bull and some of these people they are they, they have this utopic vision they want a system change you know no more capitalism well listen Personally, if you ask me, I'm not a big fan. I'm not the biggest fan of capitalism at all. Neither am I a fan of communism. I'm not a fan of any of it. I want to be free. I want to be left alone to my own devices, raise my own kids, love my wife, eat a good steak from time to time, make a video, tell you people what I'm, what I'm scared of, why I think that we need nuclear. Um, but I'm not so vain as to expect that system change is going to work, which is what these activists want. Now, obviously, this is one of those things where a bunch of countries get together, they have their summit, they sign the pledge. We'll have to wait and see how much effort goes into making that pledge a reality. People are never going to build nuclear reactors. They're never really going to build nuclear reactors when... Uh, well, even though the government in some sort of cabal fashion decided that they wanted to do nuclear. 
Look at the map that you're seeing right now. Those are all countries that are considering considering nuclear or already using nuclear or they are building new nuclear reactors. The, the, the amount of countries that want to do something with nuclear is staggering. And the issue is these, these countries don't want to do nuclear because it's unpopular in their own countries. Most of the people that live there, they say, okay, yes, hell, great. We, we're getting some, some great technology, good jobs, stable source of electricity because all they want is an incandescent light bulb, some power for their fridge, for the telephone, uh, a computer, you name it. I just sat in the train with two people from India and they were telling me, listen, I know that coal is bad. And that we get a lot of air pollution from coal. But having electricity is better than having no electricity. And everybody in India wants to have electricity because everybody wants to have a phone. So, I mean, and, and besides besides that, he says, well, wait and see, you know, it's never going to happen. France is planning to build new nuclear reactors. Sweden is doing that. The Netherlands, Poland, the UK, Canada, Ukraine, China, you name it. All these countries are already on their way building new nuclear power reactors. So don't act smug as if it's never going to happen. Even the United States is going to uh, build new nuclear reactors e eventually. Just look at Canada. Canada just announced that they're going to build two new can-do react uh, reactor facilities. This is a unique development in the sense that it kind of flew under the radar. And given the topic itself, if the pledge starts to be acted on, there's going to be a lot of debate about it. So yeah, it flew under your radar, Bo, uh, but that's because you were not looking good enough. You were un disinterested uh, because it, these pledges were well advertised at all the national broadcast TV stations. It was... Uh, uh, it was all over it was plastered all over the internet newspapers were writing about it i mean i can i, I can tell you practically practically every european country this was nearly front page news if not front page news it even was news in the united states but depending on what kind of uh media you you, you but depending on what kind of media you consume in the United States, you might have missed it because the United States has a really strange media system. Doesn't make doesn't make much sense to me because it's hyper partisan. Now, and that's why I want to say, I mean, just because you didn't see it happen doesn't mean that it happened under the radar, that it was some kind of surreptitious thing that these governments were doing. It was it was announced. They, these people have megaphones that were shouting it in, into your face. You were just too, 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 you were just too preoccupied with something else to hear it. That that's it. And just look at the trend because this is very interesting. This is very interesting. Just look at it. The disparity between you know what what, what Republicans want and what Democrats want in the United States. You you can see the clear divide. Offshore drilling. People don't want it especially Democrats don't want it. Republicans say, well, maybe it's... A... Now, just look at the disparity here. Democrats, they don't want offshore drilling. They don't want hydro hydraulic fracture fracturing. And they don't want coal mining. They really don't. It's all well below... It's all well below 30% acceptance. Republicans, they say, okay, that's fine. But there are three, three things in energy that Republicans and Democrats relatively agree upon where they say okay at least 50 percent wants more of this and look at the trends look at the trends solar power there's a disparity and it's growing more you know the democrats they stay they stay in line they say okay no 93 percent of us we like solar powers but the dem but for some reason the republicans are going down wind power democrats love it even more you know, 91% say we want more wind power. Republicans, they are going down. They say, nah, wind power is not for me. But look at nuclear power. It's the only graph. It's the only, only, only graph on the entire thing that shows that both Democrats and Republicans have this same tendency. They, they, they grow to accept it more. 
because even Biden is in favor of nuclear energy and as he should, as he should, and his administration is doing great work on nuclear. So don't act as if this is going to be some grand debate. It's not. And the debate should stop now because the people who say, okay, there's a debate, you are, if you really care about climate change, you should tell them to accept the fact that we need more technologies to combat this climate change problem. So I'm sorry for this rant, but I felt it was really necessary for me to vent because I was growing incredibly frustrated with some of the stuff here. Now, if you want to add something to the discussion, please leave a comment. That's the that's a lifeblood of this channel because I have a um, an intermittent, I'm, I'm like a renewable I'm like a renewable content creator because I am depressed from time to time. I, I simply can't work. This makes the YouTube algorithm penalize me every time again I get re return. Then it says, okay, here you have 80 views. Well, your last video had two and a half thousand views. So please leave a comment. Please share it. Please like it. Now, you, most of you know I don't earn much. I only have like a 700 euro benefits because I because I have a recurring depressive disorder. If you want to help me feed my kids, pay for food, you know, uh, buy new clothes, or maybe get some new equipment the, one of these days because my, my equipment is dying. Uh, I have a Patreon page. You can become a supporter there or PayPal is also accepted. Now, don't forget, these are the people that are my heroes, my Patreon supporters. These are my Jedi Masters. I thank you all for watching and may the strong force be with you. Bye -bye.